Um, thanks for everyone joining us. Uh, before we really get started, just real quick, this is more for the graduate students, but the three minute thesis program at Eastern is finally up and running. I remember Dr. Uh, Oakley mentioning it or talking about it to us uh, like last year or, or yeah, like my first semester of grad school, but I know it's been in the works for a while. Um, but I'm already signed up for at least one of the workshops. Uh, so yeah, all the other second year grad students should probably also at least sign up for the workshops. And even if they don't ultimately do it, which they probably should, they should have probably at least join the workshops and learn a little bit more about it. Uh, since we're wrapping it up, we can do it. It's pretty simple concept, so I'm pretty excited about it. Um, but I don't really have anything else to say about it. I don't know too much more about it than that. Uh, but if anyone has any other announcements or anything, uh, now would be the time. I assume that means uh, there's no announcements. And so I'll go ahead and let you do the introduction, Stephen, and then we can get on. Great. All right. Well, uh, my pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker. And Glenn, it's Kaylee's, right? Yeah. Glenn Kaylee's, who, who graduated from EKU in 2016 from, uh, uh, with a wildlife management degree and a GIS certificate. And uh, while I was EKU, he spent many hours, and that's an understatement, weeks of hours uh, getting experience in forest ecology at Maywoods, camera trapping, bobcat radio telemetry, bird banding, wetland plant, herbarium work, GIS remote sensing research, basically any and all experiences he could get as a student. And after graduating, he was hired by the um, Washington State Department of Transportation Fish and Wildlife Program as a natural resource technician, later promoted to wildlife biologist, and he now is the, the habitat connectivity biologist for the Washington State of, uh, Depor uh, Department of Transportation. Um, and up there, he's gotten really cool, gotten to work with fishers, wolverines, cougar, elk, um, and I know his training at EKU, both in and out of the classroom, well prepared him for uh, much of what he's doing now, um, extending what he learned here and his marketability. So Glenn, at the end, if you will, um, just maybe speak to any advice you might have for our students as they complete their degrees and kind of what you went through to get where you are. And uh, we look forward to hearing, hearing about your, your current work. Um, Dr. Watson mentioned, I'll just say quickly that um, one last note that, that Glenn has given back to EKU and established the Paul John Kayla's Conservation Award that's admin administered to the Division of Natural Areas. So um, if you're an undergraduate student, uh, it's, it's to recognize outstanding creative work, research, um, or creative uh, work otherwise that's either been completed or is being proposed focused on the conservation of forest ecosystems, amphibians, reptiles, and carnivores, and a preference given to, to folks working at Maywoods, but also anything related to road ecology, GIS remote sensing, and other technologies like wildlife camera trapping or aerial drones. So you contact me or, or go to our website, naturalareas.eku.edu, and, and you'll see more information about that. But you put that in place in honor of his father, Dr. Paul Kalins. So, okay, link the introduction, sorry. Let you take it away, Glenn, and look forward to hearing. Thanks. I'm going to stop my video as I give this, um, just so I'm sure. Can someone confirm you can, can you see my screen? We can see it. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, good morning for me, close to afternoon for you, I guess. Uh, my name is Glenn Kalis. I'm the Habitat Connectivity Bio, uh, Biologist at the Washington State Department of Transportation, otherwise known as WASHDOT. It's kind of the acronym pronunciation. I was born and raised in Kentucky, graduated from EKU in 2016, like Stephen said, with a wildlife management degree and a GIS certificate, moved to Washington State a few weeks later, and then started in that six-month temporary position. 
I was fortunate to work my way into that permanent habitat connectivity biologist position over a few more years, temporary stints, and a couple retirements happened above me. In a nutshell, my job involves finding ways to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions and also help animals safely navigate the highway system, normally with the aid of wildlife crossing structures like you can see pictured here. My job's pretty cool. I get to utilize a variety of tools along with a good combination of field work and data analysis to do it. And I'll mention this up front to speak to the advice you asked for, Stephen. I highly recommend getting your GIS certificate. I use ArcGIS software on a daily basis, and I believe I stand out in my agency because of my GIS abilities. I know that every step of the way I was getting hired, that those GIS skills were a huge factor because um, a lot of my bosses couldn't even do that stuff. So before I get into the weeds about what we do at WashDOT and how we do it, I wanna to touch on some definitions of terms you'll hear me use a lot throughout this talk. The first is habitat connectivity, and my working definition is pretty standard. The degree to which the landscape allows animal movement and other ecological processes, such as water flow or seed and spore dispersal. And for me, it's helpful to think about habitat connectivity in terms of habitat fragmentation. The terms are essentially opposites. A high degree of connectivity will mean a low level of fragmentation and vice versa. And at this point, you may be wondering why a state transportation agency even employs a habitat connectivity biologist. And the answer is that roads, especially major highways, often represent the most daunting barriers to animal movement, fragmenting their habitats. Luckily, WashDOT did issue an executive order entitled Protections and Connections for High Quality Natural Habitats over a decade ago that says, among other things, that our agency in partnership with others will assure that road and highway programs recognize the importance of protecting ecosystem health, the viability of aquatic and terrestrial wildlife species, and the preservation of biodiversity. And maybe that's language you would more expect to hear from a state wildlife agency rather than a transportation agency. And this executive order was issued and signed by the highest power in our agency, the Secretary of Transportation, who's appointed by the governor, and it has been upheld by subsequent secretaries of transportation over the years. So it has a little bit of weight behind it. Another term you'll hear a lot is wildlife crossing structure. In fact, I've already used it. The basic definition is just infrastructure designed to allow animals safe passage across a transportation feature, normally a road. They come in two basic varieties, wildlife overpasses and wildlife underpasses, like you can see pictured here. Wildlife crossing structures are designed specifically for wildlife passage, but other structures like culverts or bridges designed to pass water features can still have demonstrated benefits for wildlife. And I do love my job. I talk about it all the time. Back when you used to have encounters with strangers, I would talk to strangers about it. And I'd often encounter legitimate questions and snarky questions and legitimate questions asked snarkily about wildlife crossing structures and their efficacy. I'd hear things like, how are animals gonna know where to cross the road? Are they gonna have a map? Or this is a waste of money. Next up, the billion dollar teach deer to read campaign. Or my personal favorite, how many new government workers can we hire to lead the animals across this bridge? The short answer to these questions is, if we make wildlife crossing structures attractive to the species we're targeting and place them in ideal locations where wildlife are known to want to cross, then they will freely choose to use them. No government sponsored crossing guards or deer maps required. Furthermore, when we use science-based methods to place wildlife crossing structures in targeted high priority areas, they will more than pay for themselves over the lifespan by avoiding the high societal costs of wildlife vehicle collisions, as well as the losses to ecological communities that would otherwise go unabated. So this presentation will be dedicated to describing how WashDOT decides where to invest in habitat connectivity infrastructure, what features to invest in, how we invest it all with limited to no dedicated funding, and during this, I'll try to describe some of the main data sources we use that help make these decisions. And of course, I'll include plenty of wildlife photos and videos that we've collected along the way to keep things interesting. So Washington State has over 7,000 miles of state-managed highways, and those are linear miles. 
But we also have rainforests, deserts, green coastlines, towering volcanoes surrounded by coniferous forests, sensitive alpine ecosystems, all harboring everything from endangered Mazama pocket gophers, to wolves, wolverine, and three native cat species, including bobcats, cougar, mountain lion, catamount, and 40 other names. And of course, the threatened Canada lynx, not the Canadian lynx, eh? But we also have the usual ungulate offenders like deer and elk, which are a primary concern of most DOTs due to the regularity of collisions involving them, as well as the inherent safety concerns that come with colliding with an animal weighing up hundreds of pounds or more, sometimes topping a thousand. But we even have moose, bighorn sheep, and some mountain goats peppered in for good measure. Interestingly, this mountain goat actually showed up in a popular hiking trail called Mailbox Peak a few months after being relocated from Olympic, Olympic National Park where they're considered introduced to the Cascade Mountains where they're considered native. My agency actually paid for a handful of GPS collars like the one worn here to put on these relocated mountain goats who are released near the highway to learn how they interact with and potentially cross roads. So far, we've not recorded any highway crossings by the collared goats. They're mostly just hanging out on the ski slopes. And of course, we can't forget about the small animals like Pacific giant salamanders, maybe not so small in their own mind, and endangered organ spotted frogs with their chartreuse eyes. There are some uh, egg masses for the herp enthusiast. Of course, the house cat sized mustelid, the fisher, which we recently reintroduced to Washington after extirpation in the mid 1900s and you know porcupine just to name a few of those small animals with the broad diversity of species and habitats in Washington knowing where to focus habitat connectivity efforts can be overwhelming especially when investments such as wildlife crossing structures are typically extremely expensive and our budget currently scant Luckily, we do have tons of GIS data that helps make our lives and these decisions easier. <clears throat> Arguably, the foundation of our Habitat Connectivity Program is our GIS model known as the Habitat Connectivity Investment Priorities. Like most models, the value lies in the underlying data. So first, I'll just give you a brief overview of the model, then I'll break down some of the data that went into it. The Habitat Connectivity Investment Priorities divided the highway system into one mile segments. And then each segment received a rank of low, medium, high, or no rank for two separate independent categories. One called ecological stewardship or ecological value and the other wildlife related safety. And these ranks were based on a numerical score generated through the addition of multiple compounding features or attributes. For example, the wildlife related safety rank is a reflection of the number of wildlife carcass removals and wildlife vehicle collisions for a particular highway segment. Segments that did not have a history of carcass removals or wildlife vehicle collisions could still receive a score of low if they overlapped with select big game species ranges, as you can see here. And there are three primary data sources related to wildlife vehicle conflict that we incorporate into this model and that we often use as standalone products as well. And each one of these data sources is slightly different. And I'll just briefly go over them. Collision data are reported by state police, sometimes local law enforcement, when a vehicle collision actually happens. These are only required if damage is over $1,000 or a human injury or fatality happens. And again, these are reported by police officers, not biologists. So species information and details are very slim. You usually only get deer, elk, and all other non-domestic wildlife. So you wouldn't know if a bear or cougar was involved. We also have citizen salvaged deer and elk carcass removal records. These are essentially carcass removals, which I'll get into next. But starting in 2016, Washington State made it legal for citizens to collect the carcasses of elk and deer killed by vehicles. May sound gross eating roadkill at first, but it turns out people really love this program. And some people you go from legally be able to harvest one deer a year hunting to having dozens a year if you, ha you happen to live in a deer vehicle collision hotspot. 
I know one guy who calls me just to talk about the program all the time, says he feeds his whole community and donates to the food banks and everything. I mean, people just love it, but I've eaten roadkill venison. It's, it's not bad. But anyway, finally, we have that wash dot maintenance reported carcass removals. And these are reported by wash dot maintenance staff across the state. So there's a standardized approach whenever a wildlife carcass is removed from the roadway. So before that salvage law was enacted, technically WashDOT would be removing those carcasses and putting them into the data. So we wrapped the salvage data back into the carcass removal data eventually. But WashDOT reported carcass removals have been recorded since 1973, but iPads were implemented in 2014, leading to a much broader diversity of species reported, a much a higher number of total records, and just greater spatial accuracy for the um, you know, GPS capabilities that were built into it. And we get about 8,000 wildlife carcass removals reported each year, but the majority are deer species, around 60%. And we have four different deer species here. And this information, while our maintenance staff aren't biologists, we do give them some biological training. So it comes in with sometimes sex and age of the animal when they can determine. And this is the most robust data set we have by far. There's at least three times more records than there are collision data. And each record is, has spatial data associated with it. But what really makes the data great is that we personally validate, really it's our habitat connectivity interns now that do this, each record as it comes in for species and spatial accuracy. Each one of those 8,000 a year we will look at and if someone reports, say, a mule deer on the western side of the state where we know they don't exist, we'll contact the original port reporting party and figure it out and make sure this stuff is accurate. And so all this work leads to the robust and accurate data set worthy of incorporation into decision making tools such as our habitat connectivity investment priorities. And I will mention up front if there are GIS professors or students, you know, interested in getting some of this data for class projects or whatever, I do manage it and I can potentially release that. Okay, so the other category of the investment priorities, the ecological value rank that you see here, is structured a little differently. It has a base score that is then acted on by multipliers. The base score reflects the highway segments overlap with select listed species ranges, those known to be most vulnerable to wildlife vehicle collisions, as well as that highway segments proximity to connected networks of habitat. Lacking either of these attributes, a base score could still be assigned if that highway segment overlapped with an area designated as high landscape integrity as identified by the Washington Wildlife Habitat Connectivity Working Group that I'll talk more about shortly. This base score is then subjected to multipliers based on two factors, either both factors, traffic volume, with the idea that the higher the traffic volume gets in an identified sensitive ecological area, the more impact could potentially be had, therefore it should be prioritized higher. And then you also have a multiplier for proximity to large blocks of protected land. We have a ton of that here. Um, we don't want to build multi-million dollar habitat connecting structures on private land with a 75 year lifespan and then the land gets developed into a Walmart parking lot 10 or 20 years later. So that's why we're in concerned about public land. Again, the underlying data is of the utmost importance to the ecological stewardship rank, just like the wildlife related safety rank. And I mentioned the working group, habitat connectivity working group, their products, and this is where I'll get more into their involvement. The group is an open collaborative science-based effort formed back in 2007 when that executive order was originally signed. It's co-led by my agency and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And our goal is to produce tools and analyses that identify opportunities and priorities to provide habitat connectivity in Washington and surrounding areas. Sometimes, you know, we end up going into Canada, Idaho, Oregon, but we're centered around Washington state. And this group is composed of participants from just many different land, natural resource management agencies, NGOs, tribal state and federal governments and universities. There's a ton of involvement. This just will give you an idea of the number of different organizations that have been involved with this working group at one time or another. 
And they, the working group develops tools and analyses as the goals state. They develop novel GIS tools for, to uh, make these connectivity analyses possible, including the Habitat Concentration Area Toolkit, which in a nutshell will take a set of species specific input parameters that are usually expert driven and then automate the identification of core habitat areas. You then use Linkage Mapper uh, and another set of species specific input parameters that automates the wildlife corridor mapping between these cores. And that's ex extreme oversimplification, but all of these tools are open source and free to use and they, they're available on circuitscape.org. And if I remember correctly, there's even some guides on how to use these tools on that website. So using these tools, the working group has produced a number of different connectivity analyses over the years, starting with the statewide connectivity analysis back in 2010 for 16 different focal species. You can see an example map from that study for uh, least cost path and cost weighted distance for the Western toad there. They followed that up with a Columbia Plateau ecoregion connectivity analysis for 11 focal species, whereas the statewide analysis was a little coarse, focusing on ecoregions that allows for finer resolution and uh, slightly better planning capabilities in the end. And the Columbia Plateau ecoregion included species that weren't in the original statewide model as well, like the Western Isolated Rattlesnake. Finally, recently, starting in 2019 and to the present, we are working on the Western Washington connectivity model for five focal species. And we're really calling this the Cascades to Coast connectivity model. And one of those focal species is the cougar, and I'm the cougar team species lead. And one exciting development that just happened yesterday is I was on a discussion with multiple Indian tribes from the peninsula out in this area, as well as Mark Elbrock from the Panthera Puma Project. And they're conducting an Olympic Puma Project now. And we're gonna partner with them and use up to a hundred of their Panthera cams to validate the cougar model that we've just got done producing out here. So that's a pretty exciting development. And well, uh, it's gonna to lead to like double the amount of cameras on the landscape that we currently have. And so maybe up to this point, you're just scratching your head saying, what is a connectivity analysis anyway in general? It's just a GIS model, again, that depict, attempts to depict wildlife corridors as well as barriers to movement. And if you're in road ecology like myself, it, they're extremely useful for identifying areas where important wildlife corridors are bisected by highways. And with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to describe some of the um, how this analysis is developed and go a little bit into detail, but I'm, a, I'm trying to keep it fairly surface level. But you start by just uh, dividing the landscape into even pixels, usually 30 meters by 30 meters. And then each pixel receives a value for habitat suitability and resistance to movement, depending on what feature dominates that pixel, whether it's a forest, conifer forest or a busy roadway, et cetera. These values are determined by experts and subject to multiple revisions. Uh, for the cougar model we're working on, over 80 attributes representing many features from land cover classification, stream order, slope, elevation, roads, and human development were included. And the values were derived over multiple workshops using a team of species experts. For instance, the cougar model we're building right now was informed by 12 cougar experts six from Native American tribes conducting cougar research in our study area, a couple cougar specialists from the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, and then Panthera Puma Project's lead biologist, Mark Elbrook. And they're the ones that drive these values and how we get them, that's why they're expert driven. So then those GIS tools I mentioned earlier, use those expert driven habitat suitability values and resistance values to create those habitat core areas and then calculate the relative landscape permeability between them. For us, we have three standard outputs, cost weighted distance, least cost path, and least cost corridors. Cost weighted distance maps are, or cost weighted distance is essentially just the accumulated cost of movement as the animal moves away from core habitat. Unfavorable landscapes like roads and cities have higher resistance and quickly increase the overall cost of moving through that landscape. Least cost paths are basically just the path of least resistance between adjacent habitat core areas. However, a least cost path is only a single pixel wide. And if you remember, that's 30 meters wide. 
that's not very useful by itself, especially for a wide ranging carnivore. And that's where least cost corridors come in. And you can think of this kind of as the expanded path of least resistance that is wider than a single picture. Least cost corridors take the least cost path and a certain threshold of species dependent cost weighted distance to identify areas where a cougar would go, if not ideally. This allows planners greater flexibility when conserving corridors because as I mentioned, a 30 meter wide single pixel least cost path doesn't do a whole lot for the planner. And the least cost corridor maps come out looking pretty. So finally, the connectivity analyses are then used uh, for a number of things. They're basically a great overview and starting point for understanding connectivity needs. And they help biologists and planners locate existing wildlife corridors that are great and that we need to protect so they don't get a highway through them or barriers and pinch points that maybe are, are in a wildlife corridor that need restoration, you know, to make things better. And to wrap this all back around to why I'm getting so deep into this, these data layers, we've incorporated multiple data layers from the statewide and Columbia Plateau analysis into that ecological stewardship rank of WashDOT's habitat connectivity and best priorities. So you may remember this slide from about 10 slides ago. Now these two bullet points, maybe they'll make a little more sense. We basically merged a bunch of the individual species specific connectivity layers into one composite model, which was then used to inform part of the ecological stewardship ranks based score, depending on how close that highway segment was to multiple connected networks of habitat. And then that's that other bullet point, the landscape integrity layer is essentially a representation of undeveloped land that is not species specific. So overlapping with patches of the best undeveloped habitat could still net the highway segment a score of low, providing other attributes did not increase it. All right, I think that is basically the end of the part where I'm trying to describe how we know where to invest. But just to summarize, because I know I went off on many tangents there, we begin on with using our habitat connectivity investment priorities, but that is, that is where we begin and certainly not where we end. Um, it's always good to do a deep dive into the most up-to-date research and data as well. The habitat connectivity investment priorities are a static model. We use five-year data sets. And if you're on the four and a half year of this model, the data may be getting old and you might as well check the carcass and collision data, for instance, um, that's, that's uh, up-to-date to yesterday, basically. And sometimes we even use standalone product. Like we take that carcass removal data and we look at um, kernel density, basically the, the, the worst deer vehicle collision areas in the state using the carcass removal data. And uh, they, they can inform where we invest kind of by themselves sometimes, you know, the worst deer vehicle collision area in the states up here. We can do the same thing for elk and other species because we have so many records. Um, it's always good to coordinate with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and check their species occurrence data as well. Um, rare species can show up in weird places. We had a wolverine end up on a beach um, less than a year ago. I mean, hundreds of miles from wolverine habitat. Hundreds of miles, not nowhere close, and it's just very strange. Um, but then also coordination with regional biologists. Yeah, you know, there's no substitute for that. You know, um, there's a popular saying in the modeling world: all models are wrong. Sometimes they're useful. And it's kind of true, but the general idea is that you're never going to be able to find the appropriate data layers to really model the complexities of an ecosystem. You're, you maybe will get close enough, but if a wildlife biologist working in an area that knows the land way more than a computer model ever could says, hey, we noticed your model says this area is um, ranked low for wildlife connectivity, but myself and some tribal biologists that work in this area you know, we really think it's super important and we should look into that and we'll always take their word for it and we'll do our own independent connectivity investigations if a regional biologist asks us to because we don't want to rely only on a computer model. And then of course, there's no substitute for field visits. You know, you start with the investment priorities, but I've personally never written a recommendation or anything like that without going out to the site first and checking everything out. But it gets me all over the state too, which is pretty fun. All right. Now I'm going to pivot and talk briefly about how we invest at all with little to no dedicated funding 
to do so, I need to give you a little bit of background on some kind of state history here. Decades ago, when the highway system was put in place, there was virtually no understanding of habitat connectivity needs related to terrestrial wildlife or fish. Consequently, highway construction impeded many salmon spawning streams when undersized culverts like the one you see here were installed. This led to hundreds of miles of salmon habitat disappearing because they can no longer move upstream past these highway barriers when they returned from the ocean to spawn. Washington is also unique in that we have many Indian tribes that have treaty rights that guarantee them fish and wildlife resources. And these highway imposed barriers were considered to violate those treaties. So WashDOT has been working for years to correct salmon and steelhead barrier culverts, but a court injunction was issued by 21 Northwest Indian tribes and upheld in 2018 by the federal Supreme Court. And that requires WashDOT to correct over 1,000 barrier culverts by the year 2030 in order to comply with these treaty rights. Um, so worth this work, we can go from things like this to this same location. This improvement work is a massive undertaking and incredibly expensive, but it does provide an opportunity for WashDOT to make some of these structures better for terrestrial wildlife as well. And from a biologist standpoint, correcting hundreds of barriers and restoring historic salmon runs will equate to one of the largest salmon restoration projects ever. So it's exciting in that regard too. But one of our current methods of instilling terrestrial habitat connectivity principles into the state's transportation system with little to no dedicated funding involves overlaying our habitat connectivity investment priorities with those fish barrier culvert locations and then advocating for wildlife crossing structures where high priority road segments overlap fish barrier correction projects. That way we can eliminate fish barriers while also benefiting terrestrial wildlife. We found that our recommendations typically add less than 1% in cost to the total fish passage projects, which are guaranteed to be funded and constructed due to the court order. To date, I've written almost 60 recommendations that we call habitat connectivity memos. This map depicts the fish barrier locations so far that have received recommendations to tweak sizing and associated features to improve highway permeability for terrestrial wildlife. Um, the injunction area only encompasses Western Washington. And so that makes it, we, we have to think outside the fish passage project box to find ways to incorporate habitat connectivity on the east side of the state. And it's definitely more challenging, but most of our successful efforts to date involve collaborations with local NGOs like Conservation Northwest and local chapters of the Mule Deer Foundation. In fact, that worst deer vehicle collision area in the state I mentioned earlier, we have some cool stuff going on there. I don't have time to get into it today, but just as an example. Another mode outside of fish passage projects that we use to implement our wildlife connectivity agenda is WashDOT's newly adopted planning strategy known as the Corridor Sketch Initiative. Highway corridors in this sense are long stretches of highway averaging just over 20 miles in length. There are about 300 corridors that comprise the state highway system. Corridor sketches broadly identify high level environment, environmental issues early in the planning process, such as the need for wildlife crossing structure, allowing time for them to be considered over each stage of the project. They do this by referencing the habitat connectivity investment priorities that you can kind of see in this excerpt here. And although this mode of planning is relatively new to the agency, I hope it results in more detailed considerations of environmental issues and ultimately greater wildlife connectivity. Only time will tell, but I am getting more contact by just random project engineers and people all over the state that come across this and say, well, what do I have to do <laughs> to comply? So I do think it, it there's, um, our efforts are casting a, a broader net than they have in the past using this method. All right, now I'm gonna pivot again and talk about our camera monitoring program and a little about what we've learned from it. To date, we've monitored over 70 structures and the list is growing. I've recently started doing a lot of off-highway camera monitoring for baseline data as well. And if you count off-highway locations, we're easily over 100. And we have um, grants in the works to put some up here in the North Cascades. And then if we get 100 or so out here with Panthera, 
and they're gonna, you know, we're gonna have a lot more locations monitored. And a lot of time and energy goes into identifying priority locations for habitat connectivity investments, like I've been talking about up to this point. But just as important as deciding where to put a wildlife crossing structure is understanding what type of structure best fits that priority location and its target wildlife species. We understand what the best types of structures are for different species by using remotely triggered cameras to document wildlife use of existing crossing structures. Some built for wildlife and some built for other purposes like this cattle culvert, you can see the bobcat entering here. These were originally built just so farmers could pass cattle under the highway. So this is the location of a fish barrier correction project that we've been monitoring with cameras since 2012 or 2013. Um, there's some pre-construction monitoring as well. It included enhancements for terrestrial wildlife because this particular fish barrier occurred in one of the highest deer vehicle collision areas in the state, as you can see depicted in the purple density map. So a lot of planning went into creating a structure that would not only correct the fish passage barrier you see here, but also provide a better crossing opportunity for terrestrial wildlife with the hopes that will also reduce collisions with deer. For starters, the size was vastly increased. In fact, it's sized large enough to accommodate deer and most other animals in the area and also includes habitat connectivity specific features such as eight foot tall woven wire wildlife fencing that keeps animals from accessing the road, wildlife guards that deter hooved animals from entering onto the highway at intersecting side roads. These are essentially um, much larger cattle guards. Fortunately, wildlife guards are not very effective at keeping our pod friends out. There is ongoing research on how we could accommodate animals like bear and cougar and elk, or I mean, a bobcat, but um, right now there's not a good solution. So in the event animals do get trapped on the inside of the fencing on the highway side, wildlife jump outs were also included and they provide an escape route for those animals if they do get caught on the highway side, such as this cougar family of four. All of these features combined created a crossing opportunity that is very inviting to the plethora of deer in the area. But deer aren't the only species interested in a safe crossing opportunity here. Black bear, cougar, and a dozen other species were also documented using this bridge underpass. Furthermore, the newly installed fencing funnels animals to both the newly constructed bridge and a pre-existing cattle culvert, which because of its size does not pass animals like deer, but it is utilized by many other species such as bobcat, western gray squirrel, which are endangered in the state of Washington, and again, cougars, just to name a few of my favorite. Comes one more. And aside from increasing habitat connectivity and providing safe passage for wildlife on a daily basis, this project also reduced wildlife carcass removals on this stretch of fenced highway by 78%. We even saw a 50% reduction in deer carcass removals on a greater seven mile stretch of highway, most of which is unfenced. This is just a summary, just to remind you of those infrastructure enhancements that complemented the actual wildlife crossing structure and helped make it so effective. But aside from those three infrastructure enhancements, there are other attributes that can be modified to increase the likelihood that wildlife will utilize any given structure, such as the four you see here starting with an, uh, an attractive walking path. This is an example of a level walking path through riprap. And this picture is actually from the state of Minnesota. The rest, everything else you've seen is from Washington. But Washington has started incorporating these into wildlife crossing structures as well. They also make bridge inspections easier for transportation staff. They're important because during periods of low to moderate flows, deer and elk will have little trouble wading up streams. And the presence of water through a structure may even be a positive influence for species like raccoon and mink and river otter. However, a structure over a deep swift river will have limited utility to most wildlife species if there's not a dry traversable path at least above that two year flood level. This cat's following a level path on one side of the creek, hops some rocks, crosses to the other side and follows another level path over there. And although these paths were not created intentionally for wildlife, they're well used in all our camera data and they should definitely be included on any future wildlife crossing projects. And we have to engineer some work on that. 
Some other things we've learned. Some species like lots of vegetative cover leading up to structures. Black bear are a good example of this. Black bear make frequent use of a structure like this arch culvert. In fact, this is one of the first wildlife crossing structures ever installed in our state back in 1976. Um, when black bears make frequent use of it, it may be a deterrent to use by prey species. At this structure, we saw relatively low use by deer, while black bear and coyote crossings were exceptionally high. And this is likely due to the mature forest conditions that lead all the way up to the entrances of these culverts that are attractive to cover loving carnivores like coyote or bear especially. Two miles to the west of those arch culverts are a pair of wildlife crossing bridges that border a power line corridor. Conditions in the immediate vicinity of these bridges are less forested and more open. Black bear and coyote numbers are considerably lower than we saw two miles east, while black-tailed deer numbers were considerably higher. And I suppose if I were a deer contending with a bear superhighway, where bears like this one represent speeding traffic, I might choose another crossing location as well, assuming one's available. So bridge underpasses, larger culverts, the kind of things we want to see built for wildlife, often have a natural substrate. However, smaller corrugated steel culverts often do not. You can probably imagine how hooved animals might have trouble walking on slick, uneven metal surfaces such as this one. And no, the cow manure you see does not constitute a natural substrate. This bridge underpass is approximately five miles east of the cow manured culvert you just saw. A good example of a structure with a natural substrate We've monitored this one for a little over two years now, and we've already witnessed way more mule deer and white-tailed deer crossings than at five nearby cattle culverts combined for twice the amount of time monitored. Well, a lot of that has to do with size, but that natural substrate's a part of it too. So I've mentioned most of these features so far. However, I haven't mentioned the presence of humans as a detracting factor, but many studies believe it is. Not only can the presence of people deter animals from using structures, but people also make monitoring these structures harder because we always have to contend with theft and vandalism. Prohibiting access to wildlife crossing structures is most important during the first several years after construction while animals are acclimating to them. Elk herds, who are a very wary species, have been known to wait three to five years before using a new crossing structure for the first time, after which they'll use them consistently. And I'll mention that any disturbance by humans at that interface could extend that acclimation period. All right, so I'm gonna finish up this section by talking about structure sizing, which is extremely important to get right initially because it's unlikely, almost impossible, that modifications to a structure size will be made once it has been constructed. These things have a 75 year lifespan and um, we pretty much have a once in a lifetime chance to get them right size wise for wildlife. Other features that contribute to an animal's usage of a structure, such as fencing, jump outs, wildlife guards, those are more easily modified after the fact, but you have to get sizing right initially. And when you're deciding on a structure size, you need to know your target species and their requirements. Otherwise, you might end up with a tight fit or no fit at all. And so typical structure dimensions will always be important, such as the length, width, and height. But we're also interested in another metric known as openness, which will help us judge the suitability of a structure size for target species. And you can see that simple equation for openness floating there in the sky. Washington and Colorado recommend a minimum openness of 2.0 for deer if you're calculating in feet. And I'm gonna speak in feet for the rest of this. Um, but we go a step further and recommend that minimum openness of 2.0 in conjunction with a minimum width of 20 feet and a minimum vertical clearance of 15 feet for deer species. If you want to hit that 2.0 perfectly, that equates to about a 100 foot long structure. And although elk are gregarious in other aspects of their lives, like when they take advantage of Peter's Inn continental breakfast without even paying for a room, they're actually quite timid when it comes to using an undersized structure. Elk are considered openness obligates, meaning they require large open lines of sight to feel comfortable. Consequently, elk require larger crossing structures than deer, much larger. Other species with similar requirements to elk include grizzly bears and pronghorn antelope, maybe even greater sage grouse, but they're all very rare in Washington and don't really occur near highways. So if you're considering openness obligates, you're almost always thinking about elk around here. 
Based on our data, we recommend a minimum openness of 18.0 for elk, nine times larger than that one we recommend for deer. And again, this openness in, uh, should be considered in conjunction with a minimum width of 60 feet and a minimum height of 15 feet. And if you're doing the math, that's 50 feet long. That's average for a two lane highway. And if it's gonna get longer than that, you need to increase these other dimensions so you can hit that openness value. And structures that are sized large enough for deer will accommodate most other species in the state, excluding elk, grizzly bear, pronghorn antelope, and maybe mountain goats, which like I mentioned earlier, we are looking into. Here are some of those goats being relocated. Um, we're not sure. My gut feeling tells me mountain goats are probably open this obligates because they live in alpine ecosystems and they're used to wide open vistas, but that's just a guess. All right, I'm gonna finish up this whole thing now by talking about the Snoqualmie Pass East project. If you Googled Washington State and habitat connectivity, you would probably find info about this project, sometimes referred to as the biggest wildlife crossing you've never heard of. When complete, it will be rivaled only by the godfather of crossing projects in Banff National Park, Canada. Close to three dozen large wildlife crossing structures have either been built or planned to be built across a 15 mile stretch of Interstate 90 that cuts through the Cascade Mountain Range. And when I say large, I mean large. These structures are typically at least three times larger than our minimum recommendations for elk. The idea here was to achieve full ecological connectivity, including of wetlands, which was necessary considering widening of this already well-documented barrier would only make things worse for wildlife. Among those structures already completed includes the Ketchelis Wildlife Overpass, which you can see being constructed here as well as many other wildlife crossing structures capable of passing the large diversity of species in the area, including over a hundred smaller culverts designed to carry surface water and small animals like reptiles and amphibians. While this project may represent the crown jewel of current habitat connectivity achievements in Washington, it does not represent the way that WashDOT typically addresses the need for more permeable highways. Instead, we use the methods I've tried to outline leading up to this point. But this project is unique because of its massive scope and scale and because of the many voices that were heard during the planning process. I-90 through Snoqualmie Pass is a major economic and travel thoroughfare and it experiences frequent closures throughout the winter due to inclement weather, which is costly and hazardous to the many people and industries that rely on the major east-west connection. Problems associated with I-90's unpredictable closures spurred interest in expanding and upgrading this corridor. An increased number of lanes and improved avalanche bridges were necessary to appease major economic interests and to continue the flow of goods and travelers safely across the mountains. But environmental issues also had to be addressed. This area is an extremely important wildlife corridor between the North and South Cascades, and the required construction would be smack dab in the middle of it. Furthermore, this land is managed by the U.S. Forest Service and only leased by the Department of Transportation and the Forest Service have an agency mandate to protect it for wildlife connectivity. To expand the highway here meant that wildlife connectivity measures must be implemented. In the words of Doug McDonald, former WashDOT Secretary of Transportation, we couldn't let the animals stop the highway, but we couldn't let the highway stop the animals. So I-90 has represented a major barrier to animal movement since its construction in the mid 1970s. So the habitat connectivity upgrades included in this critical wildlife corridor will make the highway more permeable than it's ever been. And approximately half of those 15 miles of construction have been completed since around 2013, but the benefits have already been well documented. For instance, in 2020 alone, new structures completed between 2018 and 2019, including the overpass, you can see the feed from here, included, uh, saw over 4,000 wildlife crossings, including over 500 elk crossings at the new overpass since the very first one on May 1st of 2020. Remember when I said it sometimes takes elk three to five years to acclimate to a new structure? Here it took them less than a year, which is very exciting. And now they hang out up there so often that we can often turn on the live feed and catch them just milling about. Also in 2020, we documented our first cougar crossing in the project area, and if you know me, that's extra exciting. Um, we were able to coordinate with local Muckleshoot Indian tribe biologists and the Fish and Wildlife Department to determine that this is actually a collared female who was recorded making the first crossing. 
typically expect to see the young males dispersing, making these long distance movements, but a female crossing of a barrier is much better for genetic connectivity. So it's exciting that it was a female. We also documented our first fisher crossing in the project area in 2020. And I'll admit, it's hard to determine this is a fisher um, and a thermal video, like compared to like say an American Martin or an otter, but we've worked with a lot of the fisher experts in the state. And after much speculation, we've decided to cautiously call this a fisher crossing. And just for fun, I'll throw this out there. Coyotes seem to prefer the overpass to the nearby underpasses exponentially. Nearly 10 times more crossings at the overpass than at three nearby underpasses combined. And they like to come up to these wood piles and hunt rodents, I think. And they just act like dogs. They'll roll around in the snow up here. It's kind of funny to watch. I could literally go on for hours and hours and hours. And I feel like I barely scratched the surface here. Um, of what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to talk about what we're trying to accomplish. But since my time at EQU was filled with fun reptile and amphibian encounters, I'll finish up by telling one final story about salamanders in the Snoqualmie Pass East Project area. You may remember this picture from earlier. This is the Price Creek Undercrossing. The small, very long and dark culvert you see in the center of this photo used to convey Price Creek and was replaced by the wide spanning bridges above it. Within three days of allowing water from Price Creek to flow back into the newly created stream channel, a Pacific giant salamander was documented beneath the structure by Jason Irwin, uh, a herpetologist for Central Washington University, and Malcolm Frisbee, as I mentioned, your old roommate says hello. Dropping water levels eventually forced this intrepid pioneer to retreat, but the next year, another pit tag giant salamander was documented moving all the way through the new structure now resides upstream, formerly of downstream Abbey. So this project is benefiting everything from salamanders to elk. And a unique combination of factors plus the overwhelming support of a diverse group of stakeholders made this project a reality. But this project took decades to plan and build and the magnitude of this project in some ways created expectations from the public that WashDOT is not always equipped to meet. As much as I would like to see a large scale project like this begin next week on every important highway corridor, funding quickly becomes an issue. This project has a billion dollar price tag. So we must find ways to increase connectivity for wildlife without relying only on major projects. But luckily, awareness of habitat connectivity needs are becoming more mainstream. And the idea of providing dedicated funding for habitat connectivity projects in both federal and state transportation bills has been gaining traction. But until that day, We'll continue to fly under the radar and feed off of the larger funded projects budgets as Washington's habitat connectivity parasites. Well, and I, that's the end. That's for me. Uh, thanks for having me today. If you happen to have any questions, I'm happy to stick around as, as long as you'd like and try to answer them. Awesome, thanks, Glenn. That was great. Uh, like the inserted humor in there. So uh, we'll open it up to questions. So I think Dr. Brown turned his mic on first. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Glenn, nice job. That's a, a lot of information. That's a cool job you have, and uh, you know it's neat that you're working with academics and lots of different agencies. Um, but you didn't really talk very much about birds. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> Everybody loves birds. Anyway, um, I'm just wondering, uh, there's some news this week about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and how the current administration, the Biden administration is halting, um, you know, the Trump administration's efforts to employ, place rules that would limit enforcement of that act. And um, just in terms of uh, like bird mortality, um, uh, like road kills is a pretty high source of mortality for birds. And I'm just wondering kind of if you guys deal with that and how you, how you would even try to. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's tough with birds because when we're talking about wildlife crossing structures, they're usually utilized by terrestrial animals. But that being said, the wildlife carcass removal database does record birds, uh, owls, raptors, all sorts of different things. And our current um, habitat connectivity intern, who is a master's student, is actually doing her thesis on owl collisions using some of our data. And so 
what we can actually do to make things better for birds via collisions is still opaque at best. That's what's the hard part. We are collecting data and we do consider birds and, and then a Beyond what I do in the actual permitting world, you know, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and the Bald and Gold Eagle Protection Act, those are the talk of the town. I mean, even when the Trump administration tried to gut them, the state versions of those laws, we were we were told at WashDOT, just keep doing like you have you, you used to do, you know, respect those migratory bird treaties. And um, so they they do respect the birds where I'm from. I would say that more than anything, I work with birders <laughs> uh, all over. The, everybody loves the birds, but I don't know if that answers your exact questions. But we are collecting the data on the birds. I'm personally interested, and we um, we also record them at some of our crossing structures as well. And normally, owls picking up snakes and stuff, which are pretty cool to see. Um, but yeah, it's not. It's yeah, I was just curious if there's other like, kind of, I'm, I'm just wondering if like there's other mitigation. I'm not really familiar with, uh, you know, other ways to kind of mitigate bird impacts on, on roads. So, anyway. well, one, well, one somewhat related thing that I've heard of recently, and I don't know if I'm going to remember the details or even what species it was. It was a smaller songbird up north that are basically getting sick from this kind of alternative to road salt and the, the Audubon Society has been talking about this but it's been documented in Washington now um, and it basically makes them drunk and lose their fear of uh, traffic and so then they just start getting smashed and crushed and and so that's something that's being looked into but that's a very specific issue and kind of a targeted area for one species and the real issue that I'm always seeing, I mean, the owls, especially things like barn owls, they get killed by the hundreds in our data. And our data is a minimum. We know that there's probably three to five times more animals being killed than our data is showing. Um, so it's something we're still thinking about, but birds, whereas they may get a lot of attention in other aspects of research, I admit that in the habitat connectivity world, they haven't really uh, reached their peak yet, but it's something that people are definitely considering especially a lot of the NGOs out here. Defenders of Wildlife is real concerned with the, the barn owls getting hit in Eastern Washington um, a lot. But there's no, not that I know of, there's not a lot of great mitigation as of yet for the general bird collisions. Hey Glenn, I'm, I'm wondering how the civil engineers deal with this. I'm, I'm kind of envisioning that, that you say, hey, we'd love to put a corridor in here uh, to the to the construction group that's working on redoing part of the highway. And, and do the civil engineers have a clue on what to do or do you have to educate them on, on what makes a good structure and so forth? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes and no. There's a lot of project engineers across the state and some of them have been working on the Snoqualmie Pass East project before I even started school and they know more than I do. But then there's others, a lot of new people that don't know much about it at all. And, and part of my job is, yes, training them as well and trying to get this information more mainstream in the agency and across the state in general. But I would say for the most part, our project, the engineers are very receptive. You have to know how to talk to them. I don't go out there and tell them what to do. I, I tell them what would be best to do and how they can do it and really try to give them all the data they need to see that they can't really disagree. But I never use um, kind of strong determinate language when you're, when you're talking to them because the engineers are kind of the decision makers at WashDOT, not really the biologists. They have a lot of power. Um, so it's good to get on their good side. And the vast majority are, they're now beginning to incorporate these recommendations kind of without a second thought. I don't tell them this, they are recommendations. They're not necessarily mandatory. Some of them sometimes get the sense that like a lot of other regulations, they are mandatory. I, I don't, you know, clear that up. I just let them think what they're already thinking. And I think that helps a lot <laughs> because we do have the, th the executive order and we have some other language. And we've also um, negotiated agreements with like the fish passage engineers specifically. We have a, a specific set of criteria of how we take those over 1000 fish barriers narrow them down and uh, decide whether or not we're going to offer recommendations or not. And we've agreed with the engineers and the executives on those methods. So 
that makes them a little more receptive too, because there's kind of these larger agreements um, about how they're going to incorporate these. And generally, the recommendations will be incorporated unless, for instance, they're going to put in a structure that say it was going to be 10 feet wide. And I'm saying, well, we really need a thousand foot bridge for elk or whatever. And that they're not going to, you know, double the price for this stuff. But 99% of the time, we can get our upgrades with very small increase to the price. And I think that um, goes a long way in making the civil engineers kind of jump on board because you get all the good credit for doing this good biological work that everybody wants to see and it doesn't even really impact the budget. So usually it's a you know, win-win for everybody and that encourages the engineers, I think, to comply. Hey Glenn, if you will, turn on your camera. You can, and you oh. can stop sharing if you want. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I actually meant to. That's okay. Um, yeah, any other, other folks have questions? I just had a quick question. Um, Great presentation, by the way. Um, so at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned I'm just working with a uh, frog species of, with, uh, with wood frogs as part of my master's project. You mentioned a frog species I wasn't uh, familiar with at the beginning. Do you remember what that was? Was it the organ spotted frog, maybe? That was it. That was it. Um, there's that one out and just sort of like a follow up. So how do like, if you showed a lot of these like uh, short recordings of, of species crossing these corridors, how do like amphibian and reptile really like herps overall, like their sightings stack up against the mammals because they seem to dominate? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I actually cut out a slide to talk about that because I could have gone on another five minutes about it and I already knew I was well over. But the problem, and I love the herps as well. The, the problem with the current camera trap technology is they're designed in part to use body heat, a change in ambient temperature plus movement to trigger. And so they don't trigger on ectotherms or, or they don't trigger on amphibians and uh, reptiles very often unless they were just sunning in the area and then you know slither under a shaded structure. Sometimes we'll get snakes that way. And it's um, an issue that I am constantly thinking about how to deal with. I've, I've actually written a couple proposals for grant funding to get there are several modified camera traps. There's one called like the Hobbs camera trap, H-O-B-B-S, if you Google that. And these are designed in a couple of different ways to work for reptiles and amphibians. They still have major limitations and they're kind of, they're pretty expensive, but it's definitely something that I um, aim to get into service eventually, especially on our east side where we have a lot of really cool kind of rare snake species like the striped whip snake or the California mountain king snake. And the east side is where all they, they all exist. And I really would like to get a few of those Hobbs camera traps out there. And they basically use like um, a kind of ramp in front of the camera that has actual lasers that focus at each other. So then the amphibian, as it climbs over this ramp, it breaks the laser and that causes the trigger rather than sensing movement in an ambient temperature change. But then that the ramp they have to crawl over is often limited in size. So if you want to search, look at a culvert that's 20 feet wide, they, these camera traps sell these that work up to like six feet wide, you know? And so there's still a lot of limitations, um, but it's that's one of the major limitations of camera trapping technology that I really hope to get over one day um, so that we can start doing more herp monitoring. Because right now it's so inconsistent, it's not even worth considering that we're monitoring for herps because they only, the cameras we use only detect them randomly. Um, so we can't say we're getting them with any regularity, but I really wish we could. And um, we're facing budget issues like everybody else right now due to COVID and a couple other things. And, um, but it's always on my radar and I've, I'm definitely, I've written proposals before and I'll write more and hopefully we can start um, trying to document the reptiles and amphibians as well. And there's people at the Department of Fish and Wildlife that would really like us to do that too. So I think it's definitely going to happen eventually. But a lot of times you, you make the best case for non-wildlife centric people by focusing on the safety aspects associated with collisions with wildlife and Unfortunately, they don't never amount to much, unless maybe you're on the island of Komodo when you're talking about herps. Um, so you can't get the attention of like executives that are non-biologists a lot of the time saying people are going to get hurt. And um, so it, it's harder to get money specifically for herps, but I'm always trying. Okay, cool. Thank you. 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, in your monitoring of these crossings, have you ever found in your experience any of them to function as any sort of ecological trap in terms of like predator prey relationships because you're funneling all of the wildlife through one area? No, we haven't. And that's a fairly common question. So it is something that I've looked into and all of the studies that have focused specifically on that have not seen any sort of link to the, the, the fear that maybe they will function as prey traps due to predators lying in wait. The fact of the matter is most carnivores, most predators are very wary of people and they're not gonna spend their time hanging out next to a road. They usually make quick dashes through these things. I estimate that most wildlife crossings we document are five seconds or less, you know? And I just don't think, and the literature hasn't shown yet that it will amount to um, a prey trap in that sense because, you know, regularity as far as wildlife crossings go is it's fairly regular. But when you're talking about a predator and wait, I mean, yeah, you could easily go three, four, five days, even at the most active structure before a deer walks through again. So it's not like it's the easiest place to sit and hunt. And then you also have those added pressures for the carnivores of being near human development. And I think those are the main reasons it's not an issue, but we haven't noticed anything in our data and, um, a lot of the literature that I've reviewed hasn't found that to be an issue either, but it is a common question. It's a good question. It's worth thinking about for sure. Other questions? Hey, I had a question, Glenn. Did you help um, design that the connectivity, the actual GIS uh, connectivity? Were you part of yeah. that? Um, the Cougar one, I did. The, um, the Cascades to Coast model, yeah very active in that. I'm, I'm essentially a leader in that now because my supervisor retired and um, it's WatchDOT and WDFW led. And I was also the cougar species lead. We did five focal species for that model. Um, cougar, fisher, western gray squirrel, beaver, and mountain beaver, which you may not be familiar with. I was until I moved out here. Not related to beaver. There's a little rodent. But um, but I yeah, focused on the cougar one and I'm doing a lot of the write-ups and a lot of the analyses. And, but the actual um, putting the parameters into the, the tools, we, had a, we, we contracted with someone to do that. But I was the one that kind of like corralled all the cougar experts. We got all the habitat and resistance values down and you know we would get the first iteration of the model back and we would look through the model and pick out what we liked and didn't like. And then, I think we ended up doing three iterations for the Cougar model and we're pretty good on, on that front now. Um, pretty much getting to the discussion, you know, the uh, write-up phase for that model, pretty much done with the actual modeling aspects. So yeah, that's fun. That's a fun part. And um, yeah, I've given a, a whole presentation on that Cougar part as well. And uh, I could go in a lot more detail about the different map outputs and a couple of the different things I've made. Cool. And before we uh, thank you again, uh, introduce Nick Koenig, who was the inaugural recipient of the Cayley's Award. So you guys, you can see him there, uh, maybe on your screen. Uh, so yeah, I shared I shared the report, the, the, the uh, submission with Glenn, so he's seen it. Um, so yeah, we have this coming out again, uh, it's due in April. And so any students on that might be interested, undergraduate students, uh, look up on our website more information. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks again, Glenn. Really appreciate it. Really cool stuff. Um, glad to see you're doing so well post-graduation and we look forward to you being able to come back and visit Kentucky and come to campus and catching up better. Yeah. Oh, and I'll just, off the top of my head, you mentioned any advice. And like I said, GIS, good. Volunteer, if you can't get paid to do something, obviously it's better to get paid, but volunteer work, you know, if it's something you like and that's fun, I really encourage volunteering. You can get a lot of experience that way. I've actually uh, helped capture three cougars. I've gone out seven times now, but I've, you know, petted three anesthetized cougars in my life now just through volunteering with um, a, a local tribe, the Skokomish Indian tribe, who actually ended up being one of our cougar experts just because I knew them from, from the past. So the networking is real, uh, the volunteering is useful, and I mean, going out and capturing a cougar and putting a collar on it. It's like a dream of mine. So it's awesome to be able to do that. Um, have that, uh, you know, uh, opportunity. And 
So that's always really fun. Um, so yeah, volunteer, get paid for experience if you can, but if you can't just volunteer as much as possible and do things that you like to do. So it doesn't feel like you're just working for free. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, thanks. yeah, thanks. Thanks again and appreciate it and look forward to catching up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to see back and see y'all, talk to some of y'all. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. It was really great, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you thanks. so much.